make sure to give my dad a five star review. Get, make sure to like and subscribe to his YouTube. And thank you for listening and enjoy the, the show. show. <laughs> You know, he had a tweet in 2022, so after he'd had two years to think about this, essentially saying that the fraud that happened in the election could be reason to terminate the Constitution, all the rules, to have a new election. That's the kind of stuff that dictators do. That's what happens in autocracies. They find ways to get people to throw out the results, whether it's by saying there's fraud, we got to rerun the election, There's uh, we're going to send the Department of Defense to get the voting machines. Uh, you could have a declaration of a false emergency to delay an election indefinitely. Um, you know, when Trump talks about like invoking the Insurrection Act for just like to put down protests, I mean, yeah, they got out of hand in a lot of places, but they were resolved. Um, he's played around with all of these ideas. He just wasn't, he didn't have enough people around him who are willing to implement them. And that is what they are determined to change in a second term. Welcome back, Faithful Politics listeners and watchers. I am your political host, Will Wright, and I'm joined by your faithful host, Pastor Josh Bertram. How's it going? Doing well, thanks. And today we have returning with us, Amanda Carter, um, who is an author, writer, and editor at Protect Democracy, which is a nonpartisan organization focused on preventing authoritarianism, and is here today to chat with us about how if elected, Trump will finally realize and understand the duties and responsibilities of the presidency and rise to the occasion to unite the country. Or she might talk to us about authoritarianism and how it could take hold in America if Trump becomes president again. So welcome back. Hey, well, hey. you accidentally said, sorry, you accidentally said Amanda Carter. Oh, I, I, probably said it too fast. I know you know what my name is. I wasn't going <laughs> to. Yeah, no, I don't know if you want to redo that. You can mark this or if you just want to keep it and we can. I'm, I'm keeping it. it All the, right. The outtakes, the outtakes is what the people want. So, <laughs> yes, um, yes. I'll, I'll never forget Carpenter because like you share the same last name as the profession of Jesus. So, you, well, know. you yes. know, you know, it's a lot to live up to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so how have you been, Amanda? Good, good. Um, you know, it's it's been it's I feel like it's always busy on the political front and it has been for such a long time that even though it's August, you know, it's still just been a grind um, in a good way, because a lot of like good, like productive things are happening. But it's just, you know, keep grinding it. You know, we've been talking about a lot of this for a while. When was the last time I was on? Was it about my book? I feel like it was like 2018, was. Yeah. but we've kept in touch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And, and I, I have, I have to tell you and just let our audience know like what a wonderful person you are. Oh. I mean, like we have had oh, some, <laughs> some really, really amazing guests over, over the years. Um, and a few of them we've kept in contact still just because I don't know, just, there's just, we just gel and, and you're just a good person. Like, <laughs> well, well, I mean, yeah. but that, that's too kind. That's too kind. Yeah. It's a uh, happy to reconnect with you and see your, see your faces. Yeah. And, and, and I'll tell my audience why you're a good person because, um, you know, as, as, as listeners, watchers of our show know, my, my oldest son had a tumor removed from his brain. It was really traumatic. Um, I remember I was posting on, well, then it was called Twitter, um, like a GoFundMe thing, you know, and, 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 and I had just a whole bunch of love and support from, from all kinds of people. Um, and thank you for that. And, you know, I always really appreciate it. Just when people that have a much bigger audience than I do, like just share the stuff because it really doesn't make an impact. And you're one of the ones that shared it and I'll never forget that. So, oh, well, uh, it's the least I can do. And, you know, I'm always happy to hear about updates about the progress <laughs> and good things that are happening with your family. So that's wonderful. Yeah. So, so let's, let's talk about it authoritarianism. Um, it's, it's a, it's an area that you've been writing a lot about, um, lately. I noticed just this morning you finished up part three of your, uh, three part series. So, so maybe we can start there. Like what's, what, what is, um, the series that you wrote, how, how it happens here? Yeah. Well, just to give a little bit of a recap, I think last time we talked, I was still with the bulwark and I still do a lot of stuff with, with those folks over there. They're just absolutely wonderful. And I, I can't let them get rid of me, quite frankly. Uh, but now I work full-time for an organization called Protect Democracy. 
And it actually was founded in 2017, right after Trump took office, because people were concerned that the Democratic backsliding that we have witnessed globally was starting to take hold here. And, um, you know, actually, you know, you know, my background, I used to work for Ted Cruz as his communications director, was speechwriter for Senator Jim DeMint. And, um, you know, this organization was founded by people that worked in the Obama Justice Department. And even at that time, they were worried about things like, OK, you know, they had experience working in the ethics department and they were just sort of wondering, like, well, OK, well, what happens if you know, Trump comes in here and there aren't the people in place to sort of just like tell them the rules of the road and act as guides um, when it comes to like really thorny, tricky questions. And, and there were moves that people there in the Trump uh, Department of Justice were making to sort of, you know, tear down the firewalls between uh, Trump and the line prosecutors. They're just inklings of, it. I mean, just just rumors of things happening. Um and things that weren't being issued in a timely manner, like the guidance to the lawyers about the right way to do things. And so they they became concerned um, and got together and started this organization to really just work on things like that. And of course, um, you know, the issues that we've had to grapple with as a country when it comes down to expanding executive power and, you know, really examining what it would look like if autocracy happened to here have just snowballed in ways that I, I don't think even the most paranoid people in January 2016 could have ever imagined. And so um, that is why I, I made the move over. I guess I've been there for a year now um, because I had been at Bulwark. I'd been at CNN. I'd been working on the media side so much. And I still had a, a comms itch. Like I really like doing communications work and always had the itch of like wanting to work on policy issues again, um, but still with a communication and media standpoint. And so I came over and one of the big projects, you know, my, my sort of first assignment at the organization was to look at all the research that these really wonderful, it's a big group. We've got 130 people, people that worked in the Trump Department of Justice, people that worked for Homeland Security. I mean, people that formerly worked for the January 6th committee. Um, where, you know, where, is, where is it located at? Um, so we don't have a headquarters. We're pretty much remote mm. based. It's very unique that way. Um, we have a lot of different offices, one in D.C., one in Philly, some in Boston, where people kind of hub in and out of. Um, but that's deliberate, right, so that we can actually have a widespread network across the country. Um, you know, we've got people who can get to Arizona real quick, the people involved, a lot of legal issues there. Um, <laughs> we've, we've got so many work streams going right now, actually. Um, you know, Texas, Georgia. I mean, we're really active in a lot of different places, but so many people were doing all these things and doing all this work and noticing all these trends um, that I came in to really try to help establish like, okay, how do we put these things together and explain what we're doing and how it can happen here and why it's actually correct and proper to use a word like authoritarianism, because that sounds like wacky, right? Like we're a democracy, it's not going to happen here. Um, and so my first project was to look at all the different trends that people have been tracking and produce a report um, that was called the Authoritarian Playbook 2020-25. And that uh, we put out in January of this year. And what it did was specifically look at Trump's campaign promises and pledges and, and, and evaluate the ways that it kind of goes beyond normal politics in um the plans that he has that would systematically, you know, dismantle democracy. And that sounds like big and scary. But when you look at things like his promises to pardon the January 6th rioters, and you take a clear look at that and see like, okay, that is a way of providing a license for political violence and law breaking. Um, that's, that's kind of a big deal. Like that's abusing the pardon, pardon power. Absolutely. Um, and he did do it in his first term. But he plans to take that much further. I mean, in even the incident that we saw this week, you know, whatever happened at Arlington Cemetery oh. where an unnamed aide, according to the army people and everyone that reporting on it, had a physical altercation with a female cemetery staffer. And that wow. is the kind of, you know, it's, it's not violent, but it is violence that's condoned mm. and continues to be welcomed. And so... You know, we, we looked at things like that and like how the Department of Justice would be weaponized and, you know, what exactly how it could take place by tearing down these firewalls and things like norms that all these, you know, democracy geeks care about 
um, how it would transform the federal government. And so then more recently, because that ended up being a really long report, so not as long as the Heritage 2025 manual, but, but maybe well, kind of close. massive. <laughs> yeah, it's not 900 pages. But um, because we have this cool newsletter, uh, I hope your listeners will check out. It's free. It's called If You Can Keep It. Um, we broke that down into a three-part newsletter talking about how um, autocracy would take hold here incrementally. And so um, that's what brings us to today. That's kind of a long way to talk about it. And we'll talk about the specifics. Um, but that's, that's really good. kind of some of the backstory. Sorry for talking so much. No, no, it, it's, no, it's, it, it, it's, it's pretty fine. I was, I was going to say your, your newsletter and the newsletter I get from Vote Beat are like the two that I read okay, um, cool. in any regularity. So um, kudos to you all. And then I, I also just wanted to, you know, give a little bit more kudos to Prote- Protect Democracy because it always seems like whenever there's like a a new story that you know required some really fancy lawyering, um, that there's always like a representative of Protect Democracy involved. Like, so whether it's like the 2000 Mules case... Yep. Or like the Jessica Denson case, <laughs> like yeah. like you all are like in in all of that. I mean, like how do you, how do you even like get like how are you able to do all that? Well, we we have a lot of people smarter than me that are, <laughs> that are that are actually doing the work on it. But one of the work streams is a project called Law for Truth, and so how that started was by our staffers tracking the way that disinformation was weaponized in the 2020 election, like through films like 2000 Newells and et cetera. And I'm going to talk a little generally because a lot of this litigation is still active. Um, But this is, you know, a lot of stuff that's open in the press. I'm not revealing any kind of secrets. But the general idea here was like, okay, we see how real people are being hurt. People like Ruby Freeman, Shea Moss, postal workers in Pennsylvania that are targeted, you know, the people whose faces they blurred out in the movie and made them out to be criminals. Um, Those people suffered real harm. And so... A lot of, you know, really smart people were asking, well, how can we stop it? What can we do about it? And sort of looking for like new laws and new things to do. And our people took a very smart look at the books and said, we have existing laws that can be used. I mean, we can use defamation law to to stand up for these people. And so that's what Law for Truth Mm. does. It looks at existing laws um, through defamation, finds, it doesn't find people because we know who we are, but supports real people who have been harmed um, and may not have the resources, resources or ability to go, you know, to go get accountability from someone like Rudy Giuliani. I mean, I, I think people look at him and see his podcast and kind of think he's a joke, you know, the hair dye dripping down his face. Um, <laughs> but he but he was the president's right hand man in these conspiracies. A lot of people, they saw the former mayor, they saw a former presidential candidate and took his word. Um, when he was doing field hearings across the country and, and causing harm to th- these kinds of people. And so um, our folks have represented a lot of people impacted by the uh, election conspiracies. Um, we have people working on a case down in Texas. I don't know if you c- recall this incident, but um, in the 2020 campaign, when the Biden-Harris buses were going around Texas, they were swarmed by yeah, yeah, yeah. Trump supporters. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They called the police and the police did not respond. Um so they're still working on that. Dang. They've um, gone, you know, taking action uh, to the city, things like that. Um, so there's a lot of overhang, even though it's 2024 now. All this stuff that happened in the summer of 2020, it just takes a long time to have accountability. And people have to be aggressive in seeking it. And so we have people that are doing that kind of stuff all the time, um, below the radar, um, people, you know, representing Stephen Richer and his defamation suit against Carrie Lake. Um, that's another one. And so, yeah, they're all still very active, but it takes a long time and a lot of patience and dedication. Luckily, you know, we have the ability to do that. And so that's, um, you know, it, it does have, you know, solid reason as our organization was founded to stop authoritarianism. When we study authoritarianism around the globe, spreading disinformation in attacking vulnerable communities in this way, it's part of the playbook. And so it's really important to enact consequences for that kind of behavior from a democracy perspective. I mean, it's not, it's not a partisan thing. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that erodes at democracy because it stops people from participating in the process. If you're a poll worker and you're afraid that you're going to be 
become the next poster woman for 2000 mules, you're not really going to be excited yeah. to volunteer or take that, you know, those jobs don't pay very much, um, yeah. you know, just from a cost benefit perspective. And so I think it's, you know, really important that we hang on to this and that when justice is delivered, we take notice. That makes a lot of sense. We uh, interviewed um, someone who works with the uh, voting systems a lot, and she made the point that we so many people are like exiting this yeah. um, this profession, and it's really concerning. But I wanted to think about how it happens here. You know, this three part series that you've put out, and the newsletter that goes with it. And one of the arguments that you make is that post-2020, Trump and his allies have meticulously planned for a potential second term, and they focused on consolidating the executive power, kind of dismantling checks and balances. I'd love for you to go into that a little bit. How have they done that? What, what does that mean that they've, uh, they're consolidating executive power and dismantling checks and balances? The thing that is really stunning and that happened... They, they toyed around with during Trump's first term, but really have spent time planning in their time out of office. And I'm not tossed to talking about Trump. It is Project 2025. But like when you look it all up, the thing that underpins it is that a conclusion was made. And I think this is partly revisionist history. Um, doesn't really change the fact that this is their strategy going forward. But they made the conclusion that, you know, it wasn't really Trump's fault that he wasn't successful, is that he was stymied by the deep state. Um, whether it comes to the Mueller investigation, whether it comes to his plans to forcefully detain and maybe shoot migrants at the border, um, whether it came to going after the 2020 election conspiracies, um, they, they, they pin this all on having not having enough support inside the government to make his rhetoric come true or do it in a responsible way. And so you see things pop up like Schedule F. Um, which was a executive order that was drafted in October 2020 to essentially, like I'm speaking kind of broadly here because it's really wonky, reclassify federal workers into a new category that essentially makes them appointees. Easier to hire and fire, vet for loyalty, get them installed. And so just can, making- Amanda, r r real fast, it, just, I didn't mean to, to, to interrupt you, but uh, can, you, can you just, just um, I, I don't mind wonky, uh, like mm -hmm. sch schedule left, like is that- is that a classification um, sort of that that is codified somewhere or, or, or was Schedule F like a part of the executive order that? that no, created? it's essentially creating a new class of worker. OK. And yeah. if you talk to a lot of people, it's unclear exactly how many people could be impacted by it because nobody's done it before. Um, it could be 10,000. It could be up to tens of thousands. And. <laughs> Even like Trump's defenders will say, well, it won't be that many, essentially, because they they feel that they could just make an example out of a few. But there's no limits on it, essentially. I mean, the reason why. So they drafted it in October 2020 when all the stuff was happening with Black Lives Matter and uh, people like Defense Secretary Mark Esper weren't going along uh, with his um, desire to invoke right. the yeah. Insurrection <laughs> Act and send the military to the streets. Um, that That's when this idea came about. But it would have taken a while to figure out how exactly you would do this because it, it would create a like number one even if you don't believe you could do it his attempts to do it would certainly create a lot of chaos inside the federal government and that's why they didn't um and so it was on the books it did not go into effect because trump left office and biden rescinded it so this is actually ready to go um and that and that is how you know, essentially on day one, as he's promised, he would reissue it to get more of his people inside. And so like going back to the idea of like, why is this such a threat? It's it's because there is a conclusion, which is different than the kind of limited government constitutional conservatism I grew up with, where you want to limit federal power, right, for the executive, although we could have a debate about what Bush did with war powers and things like that. But generally, um, they want to expand it and maximize it for their own personal political use. Like that is a conclusion that was made. We need to harness the entire power of the federal government beside behind the president so that those employees do as he wishes to act as a counter to essentially run over Congress 
and the courts, even though they found a lot more purchase in the Supreme Court with the immunity decision than I think they ever imagined. Um, so, so that's kind of like where all this is emanating from about how do we maximize federal power behind the president um, in a way that I think any reasonable analysis leads to the prospect of a, a lot of abuse in a way that is authoritarian. Because if you look at the way that Trump wants to use it, um, you know, he's essentially said like one of one of the things that he talks about most clearly and relentlessly is his desire to investigate, prosecute, use the legal system to harass. I, I hate using the word political enemies or opponents um, because it's really anybody who challenges him, right? Like even this week, he was talking about jailing uh, Mark Zuckerberg um, for the fraud that he conducted in the 2020 election. Number one, he didn't. Mark Zuckerberg, like that didn't happen. Like anytime Trump says he wants to jail people for fraud uh, over the 2020 election, that's not a thing. It didn't happen. I mean, you're talking about just sham investigations. And even if you don't think that they're going to go to jail, it's certainly harassment. Certainly they've got to start talking to their lawyers now about how to protect themselves. So even the rhetoric now has impact. And um, so that's, that's, <laughs> again, I talk too much. <laughs> I, w- I wonder if Mark Zuckerberg is like regretting that letter you sent to Jordan, <laughs> you know, like, like, uh, Hey, Jim Jordan, by the way, I, you know, I, I'd rather Trump win. And then Trump's like, yeah, if I win, you're going to jail. <laughs> yeah. But that's, a, that's the sort of thing about, you know, I don't, I don't know if you classify Zuckerberg as the business community. Mm. Um, but, but the problem is that they, they you, you would think that the private sector would naturally resist like an authoritarian bully, right? Like that's, that's what we want to believe. In practice, that's not actually true. It's not true. What they do, I mean, by and large, is find ways to, pervert, to preserve their station and rent seek with the government, right? Like once you know the leader, whoever it is, is open for business um, and you just have to get in good with him to preserve your standing, like by and large, they're going to do that. Yeah. Um, you, you don't see a lot of profiles and courage coming from business leaders. I mean, I think, you know, if you look at the cozy relationship between Elon Musk and Trump, that, that proves a lot of that. Yeah, it certainly, certainly does. Um, you know, I, I'm curious if we've already seen a hint of, you know, the excess executive power breaking up a lot of our standards and norms, um, in the 20, at the after the election was over in 2020, um, there is there is a woman who became famous. Her name is Emily Murphy, um, who worked for the GSA and was appointed as a GSA administrator. I that. Yeah. <laughs> and and I, I and I just remember that there was like this long period of time where they couldn't get the keys to the offices, you know, or or the reams of paper for the printer or whatever, because she was holding it up. Um, like, do you do you think that is just a microcosm of what we could see kind of in a Trump 2.0? Totally, totally. I mean, the, the thing about how, you know, this kind of authoritarian authoritarianism works in sneaky ways is that it seems like anybody who has a shred of authority just finds ways to use it to maximize their position. I mean, GSA is actually stealthy, like, I think it might be like the biggest government agency because it owns the most property technically. Yeah. But again, like who, who the heck knows who the GSA administrator is and why that she would even think to not turn over the keys once she's evicted out of her office. Um, but that's the thing that made me think like, I've been thinking about this a lot with the um, what's been happening with the Georgia board of elections. I don't know if you followed this. Um, so yeah, there was a decision with, within the, the board of elections where they decided that they would grant themselves the authority to conduct any reasonable inquiry into uh, county election results, which is just, you know, we could talk about that more, but just opens up a lot of trouble. I mean, this is essentially a board of electors deciding that they're going to grant themselves a bunch more power because they can. I mean, it's not in accordance with state laws, but like who, who would think to do that? Exactly. I mean, maybe, maybe it wasn't so novel after the pressure campaign against Mike Pence, but they just had this little shred of authority where they're just supposed to look at the votes, put them in the books, send them away, say this is who the winner was. And they're like, no, actually, why don't we just give ourselves a bunch more power to do stuff? 
that is like um it's it, it, it's just so wild to me how people can find these small like any vacuum power in any power vacuum or think that it's there like once you have people that are willing to go find it that is scary right because you can find these things because there's this assumption that there's this basic goodness about others that they'll be honest that they're they're not going to take power that they don't need or that hasn't been uh, prescribed to them and yet that isn't that isn't the case and you you talk about the institutional vulnerability that we're facing right now, including Congress and the judiciary, like they're kind of at risk of being co-opted or even weakened, especially given our current Supreme Court's kind of deference to executive power. What uh, kind of go into that a little bit? What, what What's going on with this current court? Why is it so concerning? How, how are they putting these institutions at risk? Yeah, well, I think generally when when you talk to skeptics about this kind of stuff, a lot of people, especially like, you know, m- my Republican friends who, you know, see problems with Trump, et cetera, will, will say like, yeah, he has bad ideas, but the system will contain him. Like there's been numerous op-eds from the Wall Street editorial, Wall Street Journal editorial board that kind of get at the idea that, yeah, Trump, may have bad impulses, but the guardrails will hold in a second term because they held in the first term. Um, I disagree with that on two counts. Number one, the guardrails held, but it they number one, they're weakened uh, dramatically, and we're lucky they did. I mean, we essentially came down to Mike Pence doing the right thing at the 11th hour. Um, I wouldn't like say, like, that's a plane I want to get in again, and we we'll ride it to a safe landing. But you know, if you want to talk categorically about, OK, what are those institutional guardrails that you are depending on to contain an authoritarian president? Well, well, number one, you look to Congress. Um, you know, Congress, as long as, you know, the House, at least, is controlled by Republicans or at least there is a substantial Republican um, faction. If you look at what happened in the first term, there was not any meaningful oversight or constraint by Republicans on the Republican president. Um, Look at the first two impeachments. The two Republicans that, you know, did participate in oversight activities were essentially purged from the party. Liz Cheney was kicked out of her position of leadership. Adam Kinzinger had to resign. Most of the people, I think, save for Murkowski at this point um, that voted for conviction in the Senate are gone or are leaving or retiring very soon. And so, the prospects for improving oversight in a Trump 2.0 are are not there. There will be less oversight. There will be less constraints from Congress. If anything, we've seen the Republican Party in Congress want to enable Trump and cover up for him uh, for his worst impulses. So I, I don't think you can look to Congress exactly to provide any kind of meaningful constraint. OK, then it brings you to the courts. Um, yeah, you can do that. But, you know, as we talked to the top show, if you're looking for accountability through the courts, number one, it takes a long time. Um, that usually comes after the bad thing already happened, right? Cause you can't take the people to courts preemptively. Um, <laughs> so in order to have standing, uh, but also Trump has a friendly Supreme court right now, as we saw from the immunity decision. I think if you, if you ask most legal scholars, even the most conservative ones, um, if a president went to the Supreme Court and asked for absolute immunity, would he get it? They would say no. Um, but they found a carve out for official acts, what that exactly means to be determined, but you can expect it to be pretty big. Um, and so in a Trump 2.0 situation, 2.0 situation, maybe he nominates more justices. They'll have, but it, it's not just the Supreme Court. There's justice around the country that will be friendly to him because they'll have more opportunities to nominate more judges. And so that that doesn't improve. So, OK, Congress, courts doesn't look great for oversight or containment. Um, then you look at the civil service, uh, the deep state that they plan to purge and replace with loyalists on day one. Um, I mean, that is part of the plan. That is a check that they sis- are systematically determined to root out and make the federal government essentially loyal to him. And so then you have the last constraint. And that's elections. 
And so if in 2024, voters decide that they would like these authoritarians to return to the White House, and they will argue that they have a mandate to do this stuff because it's being broadcast extremely clearly. It's written down in books and manuals and websites and nonprofits. They will say they have a mandate to do this. And so that constraint is absolutely gone. Um, and so that, that, that is kind of how I see it. I mean, in talking about the plans that Trump has, you have to start with the conversation that, okay, but the first plan, the big plan is to gut the checks and balances. That's what makes all of these other policies come true. It's the Congress, it's the courts, it's a civil service, and then you win elections and then you have a mandate to do it. That's frightening. Um, I'm, I'm curious if, if you think like authoritarianism can be, I don't, I, I'm not sure if I'm going, if I'm going to be able to phrase this properly. Like if Biden did all the things that Trump is doing or, or plans on doing, or as, you know, openly publicly stated, he's going to do. Um, I mean, I don't think I would be very happy with, with Biden. But then if he were to make a case, say, hey, I'm only doing these things because like Trump is an existential threat to America. <laughs> like, like, has that ever worked where more authoritarianism trumps like other authoritarianism? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I'm sure. Well, I, I. I don't have enough examples in my brain at my disposal to pull up, but it seems like it would certainly just lead to violence, right? Like yeah. that, that kind of seems the end game. And so, but that is kind of why, you know, in modeling how you stop the rise of authoritarianism is not to match tactics for tactics. It's to build out a broad, big tent opposition um, network to it. It's kind of like, you know, I, not to go back to my work at uh, Protect Democracy, but it is kind of like part of our own internal strategy at our own organization. Um, we are nonpartisan, but we are cross ideological. We don't, you know, a lot of nonprofits in Washington, they say they're nonprofits, but they're really just people who all think the same and um, have the same ideology and write the same, like that. that's what they do. I mean, I've, I've been a part of those organizations, those people like Heritage. Um, this is different and it's by design. So that we do have conservatives on staff like me. We have people who work for Elizabeth Warren, Obama Justice Department lawyers. Um, one of my close colleagues used to work for the SBA, uh, Susan B. Anthony pro-life list. Um, so we have like people who disagree on issues. Um, but that forces us to focus more on what the real priorities are that protects our rights to disagree with each other and actually resolve our differences through elections and not by other means. And so it actually keeps us a lot more disciplined. Um, it can be naughty at times, um, but we all like, this is part of the deal. Uh, we're committed to focusing on these things and we have these strategies because we do need to be able to participate in cross, cross ideological ways for this kind of work. Um, otherwise it's just, it, it becomes too easy. I think as we've noticed in the broader network for people, it becomes tribal, like is, is our little way of resisting the tribalism, <laughs> but in order to be successful, like that, that is what it requires on a broader scale. Yeah. And, and, and you, so you mentioned, you know, Congress, um, would normally be a good check. The courts would normally be a good check. But like, what about like the media? Like, what, what what role does like, you know, the fourth estate play in, in this? Yeah, I mean, that it, it is such a complicated one, as I you know, I surely you are the are you aware. But if you look at authoritarians around the globe, one of the first things they crack down is the media. And it, we've seen this in pretty spectacular fashion. You know, I was at CNN when Trump was doing the fake news thing and somebody got inspired to spend, you know, the pipe bomb, the pipe bombs to various offices and target people. Um, you know, he, he's maybe has tamped down on that a little bit, but in, in terms of the systematic ways, like he explored cracking down on the media in his first term, like he had really, like you speak, you talk about the GSA administrator. He was asking the postmaster general to double the shipping rates on <laughs> Jeff Bezos to her Amazon because he bought the Washington post. I mean, like, 
who's the, who thinks that, that Trump's people, right? And, you know, going after the press is what authoritarians do. I mean, Orban's like the big new hot stuff in conservative circles these days. Uh, Orban systematically went after the press, fined them, um, essentially putting them out of business. And then conveniently, uh, Orban's wealthy ally investors gobbled them all up. And now Orban has a friendly press. Uh, you know, so it's a lot of little things like that. And so the media has, has to be wise to it. And I think a lot of them are, but at the same time, you know, we see a lot of big outlets. They still got to find a way to cover the news and have some kind of access. Yeah. So that's really among the elite ones, but I'll be really upset if, um, Trump gets back into the office and CNN doesn't put Jim Acosta back in the press room. (laughs) (laughs) I I think he likes working weekends now, but (laughs) That's hilarious. Yeah, I mean, Will, you kind of stole my next question because I was thinking about, you know, thinking like, okay, yeah, you have Congress, you have judiciary, you have the civil service, then you have elections. I'm like that all makes sense, and I and I'm and I'm thinking, yeah, I guess he has like called into question every single one of those <laughs> institutions. Although I gotta say, I'm not sure there's gonna be a White House press corps in the second Trump administration. I am not joking. Like there's been people really? talking about just getting rid of it. I mean, what? So you have media. And then I was thinking of one more of the church. And then I'm thinking, man, like he has divided yeah. the church or religion, right? Whatever you'd want to say, the church or religion. What, what do you think about that next? Like, so we have media. What do you think about the way in which, uh, Trump has used or the, you know, has used the church in, yeah. in religion. I mean, it's, it's, it's complicated. It's, it's hard to watch. I mean, cause you don't want to like talk about every church, but I mean, certainly, I mean, you know, after Lafayette square walking across the St. John's church and holding the Bible upside down, I mean, what, what was he trying to signal with that? And then I'm thinking about, uh, I don't know if you saw the videos. I think it was the Guardian took um, with one of the, uh, the the OMB director who held up the funding for Ukraine in the first Trump administration, Russ Vote, who is yeah. pretty influential still in these circles, is Project Twenty Twenty Five, and um, you know these journalists, which I don't I don't love this tactic, but they posed as donors to yeah. Russ's new think tank, and essentially <laughs> were asking him like, well, tell me how. Tell me how this works. Like Trump is distancing himself from you guys, but you're going to have a way in. Right. And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's giving him the spiel. But the thing that stuck out to me is that he said, we need to rebrand Christian nationalism. It's like, yeah. hmm. what, what do you mean by that? Um, but obviously they think that, you know, the churches and congregations are a key part of their base and have suffered some damage by people talking about the ways that the church is being used to advance this nationalistic, harmful, anti-democratic, in my view, view of the country. And he says, you know, we, we're going to rebrand that um, to bring it back, you know, e- even stronger. It was, was kind of the way that he was suggesting. And so it's just, it's, it's just been sad because I know so many churchgoers who don't feel welcome in their churches anymore because they don't agree with some things and are still afraid. I mean, just so many friendships have been torn apart um, as a result of this stuff. I mean, I've, I've seen it personally, professionally, I'm sure you guys have, and it's not necessarily church specific, but it seems to play out in, in many of those kind of conversations. Yeah. You know, what's, What's funny or interesting, uh, and I, I've said this before on, on the show, where um, however many years ago when we started this thing, we we knew we wanted to kind of have a a podcast that combines faith and politics. I don't know that much about theology, so that's kind of where where um, Josh falls in. And but I'm really really like into just just following politics, kind of understanding how things work and stuff. And Josh doesn't follow that stuff. Um, so, so sometimes Josh will ask me questions like, like, what did you, what did you ask me the other day? You're like, 
hey, did you know that Abigail Spanberger is running for governor in Virginia? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, like, like we talked to her, remember? Like I hinted <laughs> towards the <end>. Yes. <laughs> So, um, but, but, but anyways, like when we started this, we didn't realize, I mean, and this is just our own ignorance and I, and I don't mind showing my ignorance. Like we no, didn't know. It's not ignorance when he, he don't, no one should have to pay attention to the news obsessively. I'm just going to say that. <laughs> yeah. Good, good, good point. It's not Thank normal. You. It's not healthy. It's Thank not you good. for me feel better. But like, we had no idea that like the faith community was so intertwined into politics. And again, like we, we knew, I mean, we just kind of knew uh, most Christians, you know, they're Republicans or whatever. Like I kind of knew that, but I didn't know to the extent, like to the Russ Vought level um, uh, and how pervasive Christian nationalism is and has been like well before this podcast ever started and talking to, you know, like some of the country's brightest minds on this stuff, you know, like Sam Perry or Andrew Whitehead, you know, and, um, it's everywhere. And it's, and it's, it's like intentional. Like, like there's a plan. Yeah. I mean, I, I've got to say though, like, even though I was aware of it and listen, like the senators I work for, we did, I mean, regularly like talks to faith groups and pastor communities and people coming to Washington as a part of their tours and conferences. I mean, that was a regular thing. Um, but to see things, I just, you know, what, a flag I see frequently, and it always like just stops me in my tracks. It will say it has it'll it's a flag, it's got a black cross on it, and the silhouette of an AR-15. And it'll have like some variation of like guns, God, Trump. I tell it's not I've seen it a version of that many times. And that I don't think we would have seen anything. I mean, catch me if I'm wrong. I never saw anything like that before 2016. And that's even like sort of a new one, like coupled with the Trump will be back um, type of message. And so I, it may have a cross on it. I I just, I I can never come around to the view that that's any form of real Christianity Christianity, and it's just a a really gross perversion of it. It really is. Yeah, I agree. I I, I wanna just ask you, so Trump gets elected, Hypothetically, um, he's going to pick a you know whole host of people to populate his cabinet. Um, you know, somebody like I don't know, like Alan Dershowitz as the you know uh, department of I don't know what department would he run? He would run like the Department of Justice. I'll just say, yeah, Attorney him, General, sure, yeah, <laughs> him or Jim Jordan. You know, one of the one of the two. Like, how how does he get his cabinet confirmed? Um, or does he? Um, I mean, assuming, you know, the Senate stays kind of where it is, slim majority, whatever, or even if Republicans, you know, have majority in the Senate, like, how does he get his cabinet confirmed? Well, I think they've devoted a lot of planning to that. Um, I've, you know, reading all Project 2025 and a lot of material from not just them, but people like that, like the Center for Renewing America with Roth's vote, um, who who actually employs, gosh, I'm blanking on his name, the the person that Trump wanted to become um, attorney general after to do all the sham investigations, Jeffrey Clark. Jeffrey Clark works there now. And I believe this is like one of his, they they write a lot of papers. Um, Unfortunately, I've had to read a lot of them. And they talk about essentially, number one, exploiting the Federal Vacancies Act, um, which allows you to make appointments for a certain amount of time um, without confirmation from Congress, that wouldn't necessarily deal with like, you know, a cabinet secretary. But but the plan is essentially to install as many loyal operatives into the highest ranking positions you can get without Senate confirmation. I mean, essentially appointees like a deputy um, assistant, whatever, get those people into place on day one. Right. So they are essentially running everything until people are confirmed, or maybe if they're never confirmed at all. Um, That was one of the assessments they made as a failure of the first Trump's first 100 days. They didn't have people ready to go in those positions because they didn't have the list. I mean, the whole thing with Chris Christie ran the transition program, they didn't have names. And so this time around, they're not even really thinking about confirmation. They want to have that 180 day plan and those people to go in those sort of 
I don't want to say lower positions, but because they do carry a lot of authority and power, get those people ready to go on day one. So you don't even have to worry about cabinet secretaries until later. And this is something that Wyatt Heritage has that resource bank. Um, and it really like, this sounds like, oh, that couldn't really happen. That is not going to matter. No, you can do a lot in the first 100 days if you are ready to get into that car running and you have people going into unconfirmable positions with a lot of power. Do, do I, I'm not familiar enough to know, like, so a uh, cabinet secretary, do they still have to like, you know, fill out whatever their SF-86 and all that kind of stuff? Or is it is it like the, the confirmation kind of their background check? I mean, I, believe, I mean, it's essentially just Senate confirmation. I mean, I'm not absolutely, yeah. But even though, like, even if you are speeding through the Senate, like the proper Senate confirmation process, that takes a long time, uh, essentially, yeah. to do the hearings. And some of them, you know, they could, like, the Senate just speeds through because they do it by unanimous consent or whatever. Um, but if he does nominate a bunch of controversial nominees, that only slows the process further to their mm -hmm. advantage. Yeah, right. I was I, I was wondering like if if the deputy, you know, so the deputy would be a government employee, I don't know, GS something, I'm not sure, SCS, like like that person would likely have to go through all the normal customary, you know, NCII system to make sure that they're not like a criminal. So, like how many how many non-criminal type folks are in are in that orbit? Although, I mean, if you think about but I mean, just to use the example from Trump's first term, when he says I want my son-in-law, Jared Kushner, and Ivanka, my daughter, to get security clearance, and I want it now, they got it, right? They had no business. Ivanka Trump had no business having a security clearance. She got mm. it. You know, Dude, that is who's, who's going to say no to the president of the United States when he says it's directive? That is really, really uh, concerning. Um, obviously, you know, you've covered a lot of things in your writings, and we've seen kind of a refusal to relinquish power from Trump. There are two other things that are interesting to me, the idea of kind of they're exploiting these kind of unconventional legal arguments to solidify power, to gain traction in the courts, and even this idea that the, the significant risk that future elections, including, of course, the next one after this, 2028, would be undermined or even delayed through fabricated emergencies, manipulation of legal processes and systems. Go into, could you go into some detail on that? What, how can they do that? What kind of legal theories are we talking about here? And then, and then how would they actually subvert future elections? Yeah, sure. I mean, this is like, this is the kind of question that draws the most skepticism. When you talk about authoritarians, people think like, oh, it's like these dictators that get into the office and never leave. And that can't happen here because elections. Yes, that is generally a, a central feature of our American democracy, which is why it is extremely important that uh, when the elections election results are certified, someone leaves. They accept the results. Um uh, you know, if you talk to political scientists, they say there's essentially only like three big things you have to do to keep a democracy. The first is everyone agrees to play by the same rules. Um, the second is that when there is a winner of election determined, people accept the results. And number three is that members of a, a party have to engage in cer a certain kind of uh, self-policing. Like you have to purge bad actors from your own party uh, as a central feature. And so, you know, I think we're kind of not doing great with those three things. But when it comes to the election specifically, and would this really be the end of elections in America if Trump won again? I just say, like, look at what he attempted to do at the end of his first term when he didn't win. Uh, there was a systematic campaign that started with, you know, these lies that the election was rigged and stolen from him that resulted into dozens and dozens of lawsuits that went to the courts, which he did lose, and then um, morphed into a scheme to produce false electors to Congress in a secret behind the scenes pressure campaign 
on Mike Pence not to certify the results. In the midst of that, pressure on the Department of Justice to have these um, prosecutors and lawyers seize the voting machines to conduct a sham investigation. And the only reason that didn't work, and then there was the insurrection where people violently attacked the Capitol, resulting in the assault of more than 140 members of law enforcement. And that was stopped because Mike Pence did the right thing, did his constitutional duty and certified the results. Um, We don't know what would have happened if he would have sent back the results. We would have been plunged into a constitutional crisis. But like, okay, people say, yeah, that's over. It happened. Look at what Trump has been saying. It's, you know, he had a tweet in 2022. So after he'd had two years to think about this, essentially saying that the fraud that happened in the election could be reason to terminate the Constitution, all the rules to have a new election. That's the kind of stuff that dictators do. That's what happens in autocracies. They find ways to get people to throw out the results, whether it's by saying there's fraud, we got to rerun the election, There's uh, we're going to send the Department of Defense to get the voting machines. Uh, you could have a declaration of a false emergency to delay an election indefinitely. Um, you know, when Trump talks about like invoking the Insurrection Act for just like to put down protests, I mean, yeah, they got out of hand in a lot of places, but they were resolved. Um, he's played around with all of these ideas. He just wasn't, he didn't have enough people around him who are willing to implement them. And that is what they are determined to change in a second term. And so if you ask, would it really be the end of elections? All he needs are people around him to say yes. Once he has that power of the federal government, it will, I don't want to scare people, but we came close. We could have been plunged into a constitutional crisis and people, there's no playbook in exactly how to handle that. Like, oh, you take this to court, take it to court that again, you go to court after the bad thing happened, right? Yeah. So mm-hmm. it's just, we, we came close. He plays around with these ideas a lot. He did as president. He continues to talk about it. In that tweet that he had, or Truth Social posting about terminating the Constitution and throwing out all the rules to rerun an election, um, he didn't he didn't come up with that out of nowhere because that's the stuff that authoritarians have done successfully around the globe for eons. You know, um, well, number one, I think it's too late. I think you've already scared everybody. Yes. Um, um, and uh, but <laughs> but number two, like like you're you're a Republican. Um, at least you were the last time you're on the show. Yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, that is <laughs> such, such a weird question to me. It's just like, yeah, like I am a Republican, but like that does not mean I'm always Republican, no matter what. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like in any scenario, forever. It, uh, Republican isn't always Republican, you know, like, true, true. Yeah, at least it, it shouldn't be because otherwise you end up. Yeah. You, you, you're not the storm, the Capitol kind of Republican. No, no, <laughs> no, so that's that's good. But 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 I'm sure there's lots of Republicans that listen to our show. I mean, like when I look at the metrics and all the little fancy podcast thing, it's like those that listen to our show also listen to the bulwark. You know, so um, and it's probably because we got a conservative, we got a progressive, whatever the case may be. But if you are a conservative listening to everything that you just said, you know, feeling kind of down, like and very pessimistic about the future, like like are are you are you saying that in order for America not to turn into an authoritarianism is that it, is that they have to vote for Harris? Like, is that is that the solution? I mean. I think there's there's one person in this race that is authoritarian and it is Trump, Mm. right? Like, you know, I I guess there's a lot of people that still want to save their political identity, save face, sit on the sidelines, write in Edmund Burke or what have you. I mean, that's your choice. I mean, I'm not going to, I'm not going to tell anybody how to vote, but I can tell you if we go down this road laid out by the person who happens to be the Republican candidate, there's going to be consequences. And I'm not telling you it's all going to happen on day one or all of it is going to come true. I am telling you, these are the scenarios that if you take any analysis of, you know, what happened in the past and what he's promised, these are things that can happen. You know, pick, pick one. Are you, if you're willing to live with any of them, I guess like, okay, but understand this 
if these things come into play, it will transform what it means to be an American. And so I don't think that like it's even a political question. It's just which road do you want to go down? And if you want to be a Republican, there's lots of ways like vote down ballot Republican. Like it's not there's lots of other ways. You're not saying like I've thrown out every political belief I've ever had. It's just a vote. You know, like it's I think we assign too much to this idea of like, oh, I voted for this person. Therefore, I support them and I'm for everything. It, get out of that mindset. Like the, the tribalism really, this, I think this is an opportunity to, to break that kind of tribal fever where we've just got into the mindset of it's red, blue, pick a team and I'm for them no matter what. It is not healthy. And again, like, again, I don't like telling anybody how to vote. Um, but if you are always a Republican vote, if you're always a Democratic vote, if you're always a Libertarian vote, um, you might want to examine where that kind of rigidity leads you. Yeah, it, it almost seems like there has to be like a national effort to give pre- people permission to not vote the way that they've always voted because you know and and harris campaign if you're listening this would be a great advertising i'm sure you know like like just tell people hey i know you voted republican your whole life i get it you know yeah well, not- yeah i mean i i don't i didn't watch the entire dnc because i can't stay up that late <laughs> sure. i i'm asleep at 9 30 so yeah, but definitely. i am aware that many republicans spoke at the convention <laughs> people like adam kinzinger and uh, Jeff Duncan, and they weren't getting up there and saying like, oh, I love, you know, Harris is all of our policies. They're just saying like, I know what, what, what could happen and I don't want to go down that road. And so for now, you know, I'm willing to, you know, I don't want to be like, they're not becoming Democrat. They're just saying like, I'm, I'm going to be part of this coalition for now. Yeah. Yeah. Which, which I, I, I really, I really appreciated their, and their voices. And, um, yeah, and I think Olivia Troy spoke there mm-hmm. too. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, we're, we're we're hoping to have her back on the show because I know that she wrote an op-ed about you know being a Republican and voting for for Harris. So I, yeah. I told I I already told Jeff I was like I'm going to ask her to 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 convert you, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> oh really? <laughs> you know, I just you know, there's lots of ways. I mean, it's just it's it, it's one vote. Yeah, you have many votes in your life. Like if you want to have your nice track record in one way, like I think it will still yeah. be pretty much intact. I'm thinking I'm voting libertarian again. I'm trying to. I'm. I'm, I'm yeah, thinking I know a lot of people are taking that route. And then, then, then there's the RFA curious. I'm like, all right, just, just I look into that guy. He's <laughs> got well, some weird animal stuff. RFK. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Chase Chase Oliver actually seems like a pretty down. Like like we we had a chance to talk to him and Mike Termot, uh, and they're super laid back dudes. You know, like like if like I don't know how well they would run the country, but yeah. couldn't be it could not be worse than <laughs> uh, a Trump. So I mean, obviously I, I'm blue, so I'm going to vote for Harris. You know, <clears throat> but but still, like I know it's 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 hard out there, and people just need to come to grips. And I'm glad that you said, hey, it's just one vote. Just one vote. Hey, we'll make this deal. Uh, Will, I, I'll vote for Harris if in the next election you'll vote Republican. <laughs> there'll, be, there'll be one for dog catcher. You can do one. I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's there'll right. be like county commissioner. You He's like, no with. way. I can't do it. <laughs> I, can, I can do it. Well, um, yeah, Amanda, thanks again for stopping on by um, and chatting with us. Oh, um, how can yes, people get, get plugged into Protect Democracy and you know find out what you guys are doing? Yeah, the best way is our newsletter. Um, it is free. It's called If You Can Keep It. It's on Substack. If you go to my Twitter, I've got like a place you can sign up. Um, we do a weekly newsletter that comes out on Friday mornings. And then we also put out um, a publication called Insights through that mantle that often offers like we've got so many freaking smart people on our staff um, mm-hmm. that can write things about all the th- all the democracy things you're interested about. So you get some analysis on Tuesdays and then a more bigger newsletter uh, on Friday. Mm-hmm. So, and what's the website? Um, if you can keep it dot org oh. is where you can find it. And um, 
you know, if you don't like it, you can unsubscribe. But just try it. Just try it. It's not protectdemocracy.org. No, our our Protect Democracy is our website. Um, That is our organization. But the newsletter that we're putting out um, as like our media and way to keep people updated, that's the best way. Awesome. Cool. Well, thanks again. Um, And to our listeners and audience, uh, make sure you keep your conversations not right or left, but up. And we'll talk to you next time. See ya. Hey there, Josh Bertram here, faithful host of the Faithful Politics Podcast. I want to let you know about a compelling new spinoff, the Faith Roundtable, where I'll be interviewing top faith leaders, theologians, and scholars to unpack the pressing issues that are shaping the church in America today. We'll dive into topics like faith and public life, social justice, and how we can engage our communities more effectively. Make sure you don't miss any of our enlightening conversations by subscribing to it on our YouTube channel. Join me at the Faith Roundtable, where deep discussion meets thoughtful insight.